first uh, point of reference, I guess, um, should be that I prefer to be called Jim, and I, I think that has to do with the whole alliteration of Dr. Dickey and stuff, so if you would um, treat me that way, that would be great. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I mean, having uh, uh, known about IWH for a long time, but never having uh, crossed through the doors and arriving today and seeing that it takes a lot to cross through the doors, I, uh, <laughs> I'm very happy for the invitation. Thank you very much. So what I would uh, like to do today is to try to um, illustrate for you a couple of different approaches that I've had in the past in order to assess um, the risk of whole body vibration and try to make that clear for you, and then specifically highlight um, seat selection as an opportunity to reduce whole body vibration. So starting at the beginning, what is whole body vibration? Whole body bi vibration, by definition, is where individuals are standing, sitting, or lying on surfaces that are vibrating. So it's quite general. It would cover you standing in a subway car and the car's uh, rattling its way along. Um, lying down, there's been some interesting work done uh, in the back of uh, ambulances and what uh, individuals are exposed to in that mode. And for me, the, the, the main focus of what I do is seated whole body vibration. So typically what happens is that you have individuals driving what are affectionately known as monster machines. Um, the vast majority of what I have done is with off-road machines. So uh, in the upper left, looking at scrapers that are used in construction for leveling out uh, areas where they will be building roads or other things. Top right is uh, forestry. Those machines are called skidders, and they drag trees from where they have been felled to where they're going to be processed. In the bottom image is called a load haul dump machine and they are for moving ore from where it's been blasted in a mine to where it can be carried out of the mine site. So these vehicles um, are typically not driving on roads, they're driving, you know, in the case of forestry, they're literally over rocks, stumps, uh, everything else mm -hmm. in order to get where they're going and the vibration is um, uh, horrific is probably the best adjective for it. Um, in scrapers and things like snow plows, where there's a blade that's intersecting with the ground, those um, put jolts all the way through the machine and lead to different styles of vibration there. So we have off-road vibration. And recently I've been working on two projects. One is looking at utility uh, vehicles um, and uh, currently engaged in a project looking at long haul trucking. So these are on road, but similar sort of idea that um, long-term exposure to vibration leads to health effects. So why whole body vibration? And the answer is it's a known predictor of back pain most strongly, but then also back injury. And uh, this is the right crowd to be able to say that these are long-term exposures, so finding anything uh, really clear is difficult, but odds ratios are, are high, illustrating that, that it's a problem. Specifically, uh, an association between low back pain and whole body vibration uh, in a big paper done by NIOSH. There's also a dose-response relationship indicating the power of uh, the underlying phenomenon. And then, in terms of prevalence, between 4 and 7% of the workforce is thought to be exposed to excessive levels of whole body vibration. So the point prevalence for this uh, is also very large. I also um, think it's important to address a mechanism. Uh, otherwise, we may have kind of correlated variables, but not necessarily causal. And what it appears happens in whole, by whole body vibration is all of this energy from the vibration enters our bodies. And uh, as a general rule, you put too much energy into anything and it's gonna cause problems. And what they found is discs dehydrating, which is the beginning of disc degeneration. And it looks like as little as one year or certainly five years of occupational vibration is what it takes to put you on the path towards uh, low back pain and injury. How? 
How to measure whole body vibration. There's international standards that have been developed in order to outline how to measure and, and then um, uh, ascribe a risk to <coughs> levels of vibration. ISO 2631-1 is the most common in North America. There's also very similar Australian standards, European standards, subtle differences between them, but the approach is all the same. How does that work? Well, you measure the vibration that's entering the body through the buttocks with a seat pad um, and an accelerometer mounted within that. That goes onto the seat top. And then in small print below that, you can see an accelerometer on the floor below the seat or the label saying that. You can also measure the acceleration of the chassis of the vehicle. And the idea is that by comparing the vibration of the vehicle and the vibration on the surface of the seat, you can see the effectiveness of the seat. Is the seat making it better or worse? Those signals are typically collected with a data logger, and that would be the system used to measure it. In terms of analysis, there's two general approaches. One, you can see the coefficient here for the acceleration is squared. Um, and this type of approach is used for, for average indications of vibration. If the vibration exposure is impulsive, so it contains big shocks, transient speed bumps kind of things, then uh, the approach that's recommended is raising things, raising the acceleration to the fourth power, and it ends up um, preferentially weighting those impulsive um, components of the acceleration so that they have a larger um, detrimental effect. And then we have an action limit um, to describe whether um, the vibration is considered at low risk. So if it's below the acceleration before below 0.45 meters per second squared, it's thought to have a low risk of injury. 0.45 to 0.9 meters per second squared, you're within the health guidance caution zone and it's um, it appears that there is a risk and it deserves attention. And if your exposure is above 0.9, it's deemed to be a high risk of injury um, and according or of health risks and accordingly um, requires intervention in order to reduce vibration levels. So when we look at different vehicles, um, this is uh, these are vehicles in the steel mining or steel making industry. On the vertical axis, we have VDV, so raised to the fourth power, basically below the health guidance caution zone in green, within the health guidance caution zone in yellow, and above the health guidance caution zone in red. For different vehicles, you can see that some vehicles in their normal operation mode are um, at relatively low risk for injury due to whole body vibration. But then there's some vehicles way up here soaring in the red where there is a known risk of injury. And accordingly, um, knowing that, uh, we would imagine that those should uh, be targeted for interventions to reduce vibration exposure. So how do we do that? Well, speed's the number one factor. You drive more slowly, there's going to be less vibration. Lots of our workplaces, either overtly or covertly, have um, compensation based on product that's done, number of trips, anything like that. So, so speed's really a difficult, or can be a difficult one to manage in the workplace, even though it makes the most sense. In some of the mines, they physically lock the machines out of higher gear so that it's impossible to run them in, in at higher speeds. There's also, in our more, uh, more and more kind of instrumented and aware workplaces, there's also um, instantaneous feedback about properties of the machine, like what gear they are in, what speed they're going, where they are um, physically in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And we can imagine that it's moving towards a situation where there will be um, some manager telling somebody to slow down or doing something based on instantaneous feedback. 
road maintenance is also uh, a big issue because if you can make the roadway smoother, then immediately it will reduce the vibration coming into the vehicle. And that was one of the big findings in the steel making project where from before to after they did a lot of road maintenance based on, on the experimental findings and that reduced the vibration exposure. The point that I want to talk about today is seating. Kind of like vehicle speed, it's a great sort of engineering control. You can reduce the vibration right um, from the start. And so in some ways it's very appealing. Um, in other ways it's very difficult to implement and that's because we have a hard time telling which seat is best for which vibration exposure. So one of the um, messages that will be trending throughout my talk is the idea that it's um, as long as we have enough information to make informed choices about seating, then seating can be effective, but without that information it's really a shot in the dark. So how do seats work? Um, seats work by attenuating certain frequencies and it's important to appreciate that you cannot attenuate all frequencies. Everything on this earth made of matter will vibrate at some frequency. If you put that frequency into that material it will resonate and make things much worse. So typically seats, mechanical suspension seats, things like that are effective at attenuating vibrations between about 4 hertz and 15 hertz. If you are below the 6 hertz type threshold, what ends up happening is the seat will amplify the vibration. And the point behind the point here then is that you need to find a seat that matches with the vibration exposure in the workplace such that the seat can effectively attenuate the vibration whereas it can be a perfect storm if you put the wrong seat in the right vibration exposure you will make things much worse and in our experience this is usually what ends up happening seats make things much worse um, changes in seat technology where you can move to um, air seats for example end up extending the range down uh, to lower frequencies but still you hit them with about 1.4 hertz and they will make the vibration worse. What does this feel like? And the answer is a speed bump. Everybody knows that if you're sailing along in the car and you hit a speed bump your head can literally hit the, well my head, I'm a tall guy, my head can hit the roof of the car um, and even though the speed bump may only be a couple centimeters tall, your head can travel much further than that. So illustrating the point that the seats can make vibration worse and speed bumps for example are very low frequency. If you map that onto a sine wave, that's the type of thing that makes vibrations worse. Those are the types of impulsive exposures that you can get off-road very easily um, as the vehicles are traveling down bumpy roads. When we plot seat performance against frequency, this is illustrating that at some frequency, here illustrated at just less than 3 hertz, the Vibration is amplified for frequencies below that, attenuated for frequencies above that. And so the seats do a really good job of attenuating about, in this case, about 50% of the vibration energy at frequencies above 4 hertz. But the challenge is what happens if the workplace exposure has frequencies below that? And the answer is the seat amplifies the vibration. So far so good? Excellent. So there's a myriad of seat choices involving um, plain old seats made out of foam. Um, these are typically used um, in things like uh, forklifts to very sophisticated seats as employed in things like city buses and long haul trucks. Um, sometimes there's constraints in terms of the amount of space that you have. You can't stick any seat into any location. Um, so there's clear 
Uh, there's a myriad of seat choices, there's a myriad of technologies, um, and the question about which is best is really challenging. So with that as background, I'm going to describe the first approach to testing. So, um, so I am kind of the lab guy rather than the field guy. So I'm comfortable in the lab. In my lab, I have a robot. So it may be kind of hard for you to see here, but this illustration shows a, a, a participant. He gets credit as one of the students, so I haven't put the little bars to anonymize him. Um, there, he's sitting on an industrial seat. The round platform that you can see here is the top of a motion platform, and it can move in XYZ roll pitch yaw. So my robot can move fully in three-dimensional space, and we can simulate a variety of vibration exposures in the lab. So the first approach is lab testing. Um, Derek sitting here has got a nice smile on his face and essentially we can start with um, vehicle exposures like forestry. We measure the accelerations, we turn it into a path and feed that into the robot and accordingly um, Derek's being vibrated as if he was sitting in that vehicle at that particular instant in time. So it's not average exposures or anything, we are simulating a vehicle at an instant in time and we're capable of doing that. Capable of doing other things as well, but we are capable of replicating occupational exposures that way. It looks a lot like this. Um, so Derek will no longer be smiling. He will be um, kind of like thinking he's on a, a, a ride of some sort. Um, and the, the convenience of this lab testing approach is that we can simulate any vehicle. We can also look at patterns such as white noise and, and evaluate the function at specific frequencies, do all kinds of things, and it's very easy to do in the lab. In terms of lab testing, we've tested an array of seats. These are seats that are commonly used in mining, and based on this top row, what you can see, the top right here shows a seat that has been worn out. In mining, the vehicles are worth millions of dollars, and the seats physically get worn out, and so they swap them out and they put new seats into them. So uh, the top row here shows a, a new, half-worn out and fully worn out seat. Uh, and one of the things that we were doing is evaluating the performance of the seat because it certainly looks terrible, but how does it perform? Should they be swapping them out when they perform poorly or when they look terrible? Um, so we tested a variety of common seats. In terms of the new used and old type seat, this plot is showing the transmissibility, so how good or how amplified is the vibration at different frequencies. Uh, amplitudes of one are, and showing the crossover point show that the new um, and half used seat, the blue and red bars, show remarkably similar performance. So the, um, they amplify the vibrations below about three hertz, they attenuate the vibration above three hertz, and even though the seat has been sitting on there and, and is considered half used, it is performing as new. The fully worn out seat performs differently. The, the amplification has increased now from 1.4 up to 1.5 and you can see that the, the frequency performance of the seat has changed as well. Um, and this information was used to inform the mining um, the Mining uh, Technical Advisory Committee that they're doing a pretty good job of figuring out <coughs> worn versus half well and should continue to replace seats uh, on that basis. Um, faced with a busy slide, I thought I'd color code it. So just squint and look at colors. Green indicates safe below the health guidance caution zone. Anybody see green? Okay, so on the left we've got um, eight vehicles from forestry and vibrations representing that. On the right we have ten vehicles from mining and what we can see is that there's some 
uh, yellow for within the health guidance caution zone, and lots of red. So each of the different columns represent five different seats and how the seats perform in us simulating that vehicle in the lab. Interesting things to pop out of it when we look at the skitter, skitter four here, no seat can do anything to drop it out of the red. Seat will not be effective for that particular vehicle at that particular time with those vibration exposures. And then if we look at the column, the, the seat that's labeled as CAT, um, for most vehicles, uh, in fact, it's for seven out of eight vehicles, the CAT seat um, has the vibration exposure reduces the vibration exposure such that they are within the health guidance caution zone. So this is not a win, it's kind of a tentative win where, where you've moved it from, from likely health risk to probable health risk and that uh, in this environment would be considered a win. There's also, um, so as we move from uh, forestry through to mining, these are the same five seats. And over here, for the forestry exposures, CAT's the overwhelming winner. And on the mining exposures, the CAD 301 seat, I'd call the underwhelming winner, um, where only 6 out of 10 vehicles were able to reduce them to within the um, health guidance caution zone. And for lots of these particular vehicles, seats did not matter. They were not able to attenuate the vibration to within the health guidance caution zone. So what did we learn from this? First of all, we learned that a seat is not a seat. Um, seat uh, selection is not universal. A seat that works well in one environment, vibration environment, does not necessarily work well in another one. So in my quest to clarify the situation, I have just clouded it. I felt terrible. I mean, I'd love to come up with some resounding uniform conclusions and, and all that we conclude is that that was not realistic or not appropriate. So, um, so while standing up here and saying I'm gonna talk about seating, I need to fully disclose that seating is not the answer seating according to the options that we investigated here is simply not going to work in some vibration exposures. The um, amount of vibration is too large and the, it's unrealistic to expect seats to be able to attenuate them sufficiently. Um, the references here for G and uh, two papers, uh, uh, G was a PhD student of mine, did a, a ton of fabulous work so I'm taking credit for for supervising a capable student and producing these findings. What G also did is produced neural net models to describe the performance of the seats and this is something that we will continue to exploit in the future rather than physically needing to test every vibration exposure with human subjects we can then use the model and predict what they uh, what the vibration exposure would be so that's a interesting variant as a little side note. Because I thought I would have. Please. In, in your um, lab testing approach, are you able to test different postures as well? Like so, uh, and I wonder about anticipation. So, if you see a bump, if you see a Absolutely. Or you can slow down. Yeah, you imagine, especially if you're a driver, because then you're holding on to the steering wheel and you can use that to lift yourself up so you're actually off the seat when you wail over the speed bump. Um, so <laughs> not that I would do that. Not <laughs> that you would in your car with the low suspension and uh, yeah, exactly. all of that stuff. But um, uh, I will show shortly some information in passenger versus driver and there are differences in exposure and it would appear that perhaps, I mean they were identical seats, identical vehicle, identical time, so if there's a difference in the exposure maybe it does come down to, to um, awareness and anticipation. The other element in terms of your, the first part of your question was about posture. Um, 
and I don't have slides on that um, in this presentation, but one of the um, thrusts of my NSERC driven research right now is looking at how posture affects vibration transmission through the body. Um, doing that in the field is really tricky. Um, Tammy Eager's done some where she had um, video cameras within LHDs and they were quantifying postures, but matching those postures with the vibrations difficult. We've also had some success doing it in the lab, uh, and we put people into certain posture, rotate your, your lumbar spine as much as you can, now we expose you, come back to neutral, back rest at different inclination, arm rests, no arm rests, um, and the um, back rests are interesting, um, and they certainly, uh, modulate vibration exposure. In terms of posture itself, when your spine, um, when you rotate to the right or left, for example, you lock up the facets, it makes the spine really stiff and it transmits vibration much more readily. So, um, so those findings are, are quite uh, parallel to what we found in lifting and things like that. Our bodies are happy being mid-sagally aligned and when we rotate out of plane things get much worse. On my ongoing approach to answer a short question with a long answer, um, <laughs> I've been unsatisfied. I'm, I'm keenly interested in posture and how that works and the mechanisms behind it uh, are a basic science question which as I said I've been approaching with NSERC funding. Um, and what I've created in my lab is basically um, a vehicle simulator with the virtual reality goggles on and currently the workplace that we've simulated is a forklift and so people are running around, running around, driving around a warehouse, picking up pallets, dropping them off, um, hitting cracks in the floor, driving into and out of transport trucks with vibration exposure um, and we're still at the fairly early stages about figuring out how we're going to analyze the data because now you've got posture that's changing dynamically um, and everything but so posture has the opportunity to make things better or worse um, and teasing it out um, is difficult especially in a realistic workplace way. Cool question. In terms of field testing I guess just before I start field testing, one of the clear advantages of lab testing is the idea that we can get exactly the same vibration exposure. As soon as we move into the field, um, you can imagine telling somebody to drive at the same pace around the same loop or something, but it's not going to be exactly the same. And so hitting a speed bump subtly faster or subtly slower will change the vibration exposure a lot. Um, and so field testing uh, is a different, um, although very uh, applicable and real uh, solution. Us predicting which seat is best based on lab testing, it's a great one, it circles around and we actually prove that it works in the field. And so I've got a little um, shout out to um, my colleague Michelle Oliver, um, who led a project looking at the steel making industry and she did exactly that. She measured exposures in the field, brought them into the lab, evaluated which seed is best, returned the best choice to the field and looked at exposures. So Michelle's got a whole series of papers on that um, and I've cited the first and the last here um, and the work that I'm presenting on these um, these other vehicles is not yet published. But basically what we did is we stuck accelerometers onto the seat pan to measure exposure. We simultaneously measured drivers and passengers. Does this uh, image on the left look familiar? Squint and see an apple. Um, we used iPods. Um, so the purple box around that is to tell you that I'm officially going on a side journey here, which is that um, Robin Burgess Limerick developed uh, an app that is distributed for free that uses the accelerometer in either a new iPod or a new iPhone, 
and does um, a lot of an advanced analysis. We actually use them for this trucking project. So relatively cheap hardware, free app, um, complex analysis automatically handled by the app is kind of checking off all of the columns or a lot of columns on, uh, on some kind of instrumentation. So physically, we were using iPad iPods. Um, uh, Tammy Eager from Laurentian and myself have been doing a number of projects with them to validate them in the lab, uh, compare them against a gold standard, and they do remarkably well. They collect raw data. You can export the raw data. It also automatically gives um, figures where it looks at the RMS, so the squared version, and the to raised to the fourth power and plots them as green, yellow, red. And so you can see um, where the uh, um, vibration exposure fits, and that's for each of the X, Y, and Z axes, X being anterior, posterior, Y being lateral, and Z being vertical. So we use those apps um, in this project. We took the raw data, fed it into LabVIEW. Um, I concurrently was collecting GPS um, so that we knew where the vehicle was and the speed at every instant in time. And I uh, acknowledge um, Peter Johnson from Washington State sent me the LabVIEW snippet of code to pull that together. So a giant thank you to him. And what that let us do is plotting green on green is not great, I guess, Jim, but um, what you can see is a big path around, and essentially the intensity of the vibration exposure is plotted as green for go, um, red for bad, um, and then blue, I think, was super bad. Um, and what you can clearly see is that in this vehicle driving around the loop, they're not getting the same vibration exposure everywhere. There is rural roads. There are roads that are under construction. There's specific features that are making the vibration worse. And um, the, the, um, our industry partner in this was keenly interested in what the overall route was because that's how, what they imagined. They said, these are what our workers are exposed for. They can't only drive on highways. Their job involves all of this driving. And so they were interested in the whole, but I found it interesting to look at the parts. And clearly, you can imagine that if this was the steel making industry or something, they could look and specifically target individual sections of road for remediation. Um, other interesting things that they have, the white here shows the vibration level, that's in meters per second squared. The red is, is scaled or normalized, and that's the vehicle velocity, and that's showing instances in time, like around 1,700 seconds, where velocity drops to zero, vibration drops to zero. You want to um, reduce vibration exposure, drive more slowly, and or be stopped. Obviously, being stopped doesn't help in a mobile machine. When we looked at those specific um, vibrations, we found that they were uh, one vehicle for one driver was in the green, most of them were in the yellow. Um, at which point, compared to the vibration exposures that I was showing you for steel making, this looks like uh, a good way to go. Um, the, workers were complaining about vibration exposure, so this, um, within the context of those drivers, was labeled as a problem. We showed up uh, to review the vibration exposure and retest the um, vehicles when new seats were put in, and their fleet was so dynamic that at that point in time, only the vehicles within the red box here were available for testing. And our repeat testing shows uh, that there were vibration reductions. It was between 8 and 15 percent reductions. Um, and then the flagging the point for reductions in the y-axis, the lateral direction, because that was actually what the workers were complaining about. They were saying it was the side-to-side -side vibrations in their vehicle that they found problematic. So um, this metric wasn't sensitive to that necessarily, or it considers the worst axis, um, but we did find um, reductions in that axis too. 
So, checking the time, I'm doing very well. Conclusions, seating can reduce vibration exposure. That's the good news. The obviously the less good news is that it can also either not help or make things worse. Seat selection is not straightforward. I hope I've made that point really clearly. You can't um, walk in, sit in the seat, say this one looks great, let's take it, because the performance between seats that are commonly used um, is, is different. Um, and it's also not universal in terms of looking at forestry versus mining, for example. And the final point um, that I thought might be interesting uh, is that the WV, WBV app, I, mean, I was remarkably impressed with it. We continue to be impressed with it as we're validating and using it for more and more things. And specifically for this crowd, it looks like it has the opportunity to be used for screening or something. We can do population-based studies with cheap hardware and free uh, software. So that's very much in contrast to the expensive lab-based equipment where uh, you have one of it and keep your fingers crossed that nothing gets um, crushed uh, in these um, environments. I want to acknowledge my um, vibration research collaborators, Tammy Eager from Laurentian, Michelle Oliver from Guelph, Phil Bigelow uh, from Waterloo. Phil and I are currently working on the Long Haul Trucking Project. Robin Burgess Limerick uh, from Queensland um, has was developed the WBV app and we're working together on several things. And then I've had a host of students working with me on these projects. Um, Zhao Zhou Ji, I mentioned earlier specifically, other students who I didn't mention specifically, Pete Wakeshire, Catherine Plua, Giselle, and Derek Neal. And uh, I have had uh, research funding from WSIP, WSIB Ministry of Labor, um, NSERC, and then the, uh, my robot and equipment was bought by CFI, so uh, thank you very much to them. And then because I know that the slides are going to be available for people, I put up the reference slide. I don't expect you to look at it. Thank you very much.